Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ryan uh, Petrich to the stage. Uh, he's going to be talking about Syscall Me, By Your Name, Sandboxing, Wasm, and Programs. Uh, Ryan is an SVP at a hedge fund uh, called uh, Two Sigma Investments. But previously, he probably he worked at Capsule 8, which I think many people in this room uh, would, uh, would know of. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ryan. Hi, uh, I'm Ryan. Um, before we get started, um, this is not financial advice, uh, nor the views of my employer, Two Sigma. Um, I just have to get that out of the way um, uh, first. So, welcome to Syscall Me By Your Name, Sandboxing WebAssembly Programs. Uh, WebAssembly is a bold vision for the future of computing. It's one where you can safely run code anywhere. This means in browsers, in the cloud, on the edge, in your pocket, in embedded devices, uh, somehow on the blockchain. Um, I, I'm just going to ignore that last one. Um, but really, you can run code anywhere. Um, and the promise is that WebAssembly programs can be run at near native performance, and then you can pack these WebAssembly sandboxes together really densely, even if they're from adversarial parties, um, and still preserve these safety properties. So you can run you know, a bunch of different WebAssembly all in the same program, and it works and, and you know, is safe. Um, so this vision is only possible uh, if the separation between the sandboxes and the host is reliable and trustworthy. Um, so isolation is the key to WebAssembly's success and its future. Um, engineers building on top of WebAssembly need to be confident in its safety, um, or otherwise they'll kind of stick to more convenient and traditional methods like containers. Um, and so this is what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, the isolation properties of WebAssembly runtimes and how we can better trust in them. So with an understanding of how this works, I think engineers will be better equipped to, to deal with WebAssembly systems um, and to operate them safely. So we're gonna begin our journey by examining the techniques runtimes use to isolate WebAssembly programs. Um, we'll expand into some isolation bugs in some of the runtimes um, and explore what attackers might do with them. Um, we'll shift into some techniques operators um, can layer on top to defend themselves. Um, and then we'll dive into a specific technique, uh, system call sandboxing, um, that I've explored in more detail. So let's begin by examining some of those techniques that WebAssembly uses to enforce isolation. Um, first off, I'm gonna cover some terminology that needs a lot, so let's clear it up. Um, first, we have guest, we have runtime, and we have host. So what do these things mean? So the host is a program that's running natively on the computer, and it wants to expose some limited functionality, maybe for customization or programmability, to an inner guest program that's written in WebAssembly. So we've got the host and we've got the guest, and it does this via a WebAssembly runtime. So this is a system that's responsible for loading the WebAssembly program uh, and, and running it and giving it access to only the set of interfaces that the host program chooses to expose. Um, and so we can see here on the slide, we've got kind of, you know, a program and we've got a, a WebAssembly guest making a host call that calls back in through the WebAssembly runtime to the native component. And so critical to WebAssembly's security model is that the guest only receives access to the set functionality that the host program wants to expose. Any additional access is attack surface. It's stuff that kind of leaks out. Um, and especially in cases where a single program uh, loads multiple guests from different tenants that the tenants don't trust each other, it's, it's really important that you know, this, this boundary be preserved. And so the complicated thing here is that isolation is actually at odds with runtime performance. Uh, runtimes could instrument every step of the guest program uh, with security checks, um, but that would end up being really slow because each check has some overhead. Um, and the computer might even spend more time running the checks than executing the, the useful work of the guest program. So let's take a look at some of the ways that a WebAssembly is designed with this, this isolation in mind. So first off is single pass verification. So WebAssembly is designed um, as a bytecode that you can scan it in a single pass and know that it's valid, right? So this means WebAssembly runtimes can start parsing and generating code as they're loading it from the disk or the network, the initiate streaming. 
right? If at any point the verification fails, runtime can just like panic, throw out all the work, and say like this module is bad. Um, and this lets runtimes load and unload code really quickly, right? So you can make for quick startup times, um, and this allows service providers to discard idle programs with the confidence that they can just reload them again. Next up is structured control flow. So describing all code through structured control flow in the bytecode makes it easy for runtimes to generate safe native equivalents of the WebAssembly code they receive. Um, so avoiding arbitrary control flow, you know, just makes this translation step where they take the WebAssembly and they put it into native code. It makes that much easier. And again, some runtimes can even do it in like a streaming fashion. They can get started on it before they have all the code they want to uh, jit, right? Other bytecode formats like Java and .NET have arbitrary code, and it makes the translation steps a little more complicated with more risk of bugs. Um, so all of this making code simple, you know, the, the code loading simple means, um, you know, there are fewer opportunities for the runtime to get it wrong, and um, they can do it a little more quickly. Next is fixed stack layouts. So WebAssembly defines stack layouts um, without the ability to acquire addresses of data on the stack. If you want to acquire the address of something, you need to put it somewhere else. Um, and so this avoids stack buffer overflows and other cases where important parts of the stack are accessed or manipulated um, in native code. This often allows an attacker to hijack control flow in arbitrary ways, usually by manipulating the, the return addresses. Um, so all of this is important as an attacker being able to manipulate the control flow means they can escape this isolated sandbox that has been assigned to the WebAssembly program. Uh, so in WebAssembly deployments that have multi-tenancy, that's a huge problem because now you have the tenants like being able to see and interact with the others and that's, you know, that's bad. And, and actually multi-tenancy means you're worried about malicious code that you're loading, not just malicious data that you're processing. Uh, next up is function pointer tables. Um, so in WebAssembly, it's not actually possible to directly acquire the address of a function. All indirect calls go through these tables where you say like, ah, function n is this particular thing. And so WebAssembly figures out, the runtime figures out how to map that under the scenes. Um, so this avoids the guest program um, being able to mismatch the signatures and thus leak data from the host in ways that might be able to manipulate it. So again, this is about like control flow and making sure that an attacker can't hijack how this, this runtime is going. Um, another thing is um, isolated linear memories. Um, and so this is the only general memory storage available to guest programs. Um, and WebAssembly programs cannot access uh, the host memory, right? So you can only read or write to the regions they've been assigned. Um, and of course, the, the runtime or the host can reach into the guest memory space to, to like see what it's doing or to, to read some arguments or data out, uh, but not vice versa. And again, key to isolating tenants from each other. Each tenant gets their own little pool of memory and can't know about the existence of others. And digging in a little deeper on this, um, is uh, guard pages and lazy filling. So to implement these linear memories without expensive bounds check on every memory operation in the program, of which there are many, um, they take advantage of memory management units in modern computers, right? So um, if you ask the MMU to give you eight gigabytes of address space and you know your, your addresses are only 33 bits, um, that means there's nothing else in there except you know, reserved empty space for the WebAssembly program. Um, so that means it can't be filled by other parts of the host program or other tenants. Um, and it, it means that any attempt by the, the WebAssembly guest to access out of bounds will trigger a crash and the runtime will, will detect that and convert it into an exit. Um, host calls instead of syscalls. So all access to files, network, other resources um, are done through host calls and never directly uh, by interfacing with the kernel. The WebAssembly runtimes will validate all the host calls to make sure that the sandbox is allowed to perform the operation that they've requested. Um, and then they'll go and perform the operation on the guest behalf. Um, so this includes standard APIs like WASI, we've heard that before, you know, it's, it's a POSIX-like 
Um, and then custom APIs uh, from the host program to the guests. So the, the host can expose custom functionality, um, but they should be careful not to expose anything um, that, is, that is dangerous. Um, and lastly, the, this is kind of a lack of a feature, but like um, WebAssembly started with no multi-threading support. I understand there's an extension, but this is actually really critical because it introduces a whole ton of other security concerns around um, you know, the guest being able to modify data as the host is reading it, um, and also things like being able to time the operations that the host is doing and derive a side channel there. So both of these break down the isolation barrier and like threading is just a can of worms. Um, so I understand that some smart people are working on how to do it safely and I'm, I'm sure they can tell me what the status of that is. Um, and then this seems weird to call this a technique, but honestly, the WebAssembly community is really diligent and they've read all the research on how to build safe runtimes. Uh, language runtimes are complex beasts um, and they have similarly complex security concerns. So, you know, like a lot of it is just being very diligent and Rust and memory safe languages don't really save you when the job is generating new code that might also need to be memory safe. Um, so a lot of work goes into this and I'm, I'm sure there's tons of details of getting it right on all the various architectures that are very fiddly. Um, and actually the WebAssembly community has done pretty well on this. There have been surprisingly few flaws that break isolation. So good work. Probably some of you in the room have spent a lot of time on this. Um, but it's, it's really difficult to get right. And um, so when I went searching for implementation bugs, I did find some. Um, and um, there weren't too many of them, but that's great. And, but any, any single bug that violates this isolation model can actually be kind of catastrophic. So they're really important. Um, the first place I looked was in WASM time. It's the most popular, I think, dedicated runtime and has a rigorous security program uh, with fuzzing and proper reporting of security bugs. Um, I found two CVEs. Um, one let guest programs, you know, access past the end of the guard via some incorrect handling of bit shifting. This is hard to get right. Um, this is only applied to x86. Um, and so, you know, that's not great. And then the other one, coincidentally, also was around this concept of linear memory. And um, it allowed reading sort of before the zero address via some uh, funky restoring of values from the native stack. So both of these could allow guest programs to read or write outside of their assigned memory region, either past the guard or before zero. Um, and that could lead to a compromise of the host program, you know, or exfiltration of some data. So that's not great when you want to keep your WebAssembly programs isolated. Um, WASMR is another one. I, they tend not to issue CVEs that I could tell. I'm not sure. Maybe I just couldn't find them. Um, but I, I did read a paper that described two bugs in their WASI implementations. One allowed deleting files outside of the sandbox. The other allowed uh, writing to files that were marked read-only. So that violates some isolation property. Um, there's uh, Whammer, which is a, a micro runtime, which is designed to be run on tiny embedded systems, and they have a different design. Um, I think their policy is to report CVEs like WASM time, but I, I actually couldn't find any. I did find a bug on their tracker that um, showed they had forgotten to check that the argument stack didn't get too large, which is a common thing on embedded devices where you have limited memory, like things can move into each other and that's bad. Um, um, and then of course there's V8. Uh, V8 is used in Chrome, Node, Edge, and seemingly every new browser these days. Um, uh, it had some call stack and heap corruption vulnerabilities way back in 2017. Um, and of course there's more bugs in the, the JavaScript portion. Um, I think the fact that WebAssembly has had very few sort of validates the design. Um, you know, but, uh, so, so these were, and it's important to notice, these were all fixed, they're in the past, and they shouldn't be a knock against any of them. Um, I'm just trying to show that, like, software has bugs, and some of those are, are gonna be security bugs. Um, it is important to I did come across UV Wazzy, um, it claimed not to be providing a security sandbox, so I find that a bit alarming. I think, I think perhaps it's just early in the project's life cycle. Um, so what do attackers do with these bugs? Um, it's important to know what they do and what their goals are. 
um, and that way we can secure our systems, and this is especially critical on multi-tenant systems. Uh, so one obvious thing is you can read and write data outside of your sandbox. Um, this includes memory from other tenants. This kind of has limited use. I mean, it is, it is a danger, and you might get lucky, but it's not real. like most attackers are really after arbitrary code execution, right? If you can run code in that host, the process, right, you have full access to like whatever is there, including the other tenants, and that's the, that's the real danger. Um, and so they can do anything the host program would do, and this is like being able to, you know, like the attacker can kick up their feet like they own the place. Um, and I'm not sure, but I think this might be possible from some of these bugs uh, previously. It, it often devils in the details. Um, so let's take a look at what a traditional exploit path is, um, I guess a non-WASM program as a point of comparison. So we've got some form of memory corruption, uh, corrupt the heap or the stack, and be able to hijack control flow, and you reuse little bits and pieces of the existing executable image to add in some new code, um, and then jump to that code, and then usually that code um, will go and execute a shell. WASM, it's a bit different. Um, so WASM makes uh, protecting the guest a little bit tough. They have structured control flow, all the things we talked about previously. Um, but WASM, we have this densely packed WebAssembly programs, and so it's not just attacks on the guests, it's attacks by the guest on the runtime. Um, so cloud providers want to be absolutely sure that a rogue tenant can attack the peers. Um, and so malicious guest code should still keep the host safe. And so here, it's very similar, actually. You have memory corruption in the WASM runtime, um, you know, by the, the, the guest code that's loaded. Um, you have ROP payload. Probably you can reuse some of the code that, that like, the WebAssembly runtime generated by loading your code, or you can use the other code in it. And then again, map the shell code, launch into a shell, kick up your feet, enjoy. So how do we raise the, the cost of attack here, right? How do we mitigate these flaws? Um, and WebAssembly is pretty good, but it's not perfect. So I like to layer things, right? And so the first and most obvious thing is process isolation. I'm glad um, another speaker talked about that. That's fantastic. Um, not every bug leads to code execution. This is really effective at isolating tenants from each other. You just put all the tenants it's WebAssembly stuff in one process and keep tenants in different processes, and that's super easy. Um, and it's actually key to a lot of the other strategies we have. Next is cgroups. Um, I think Docker is the most obvious and popular way. You can isolate file system, network, a whole ton of stuff, and you can layer this again on top of WebAssembly runtimes. And we have reduced privilege and file system permissions. These ones are, I guess, kind of obvious, but they're easy to overlook. You, you know, it's easy to accidentally give access to something that you know, the host runtime doesn't need, and so reducing this surface area is important. Virtual machines is another tactic. It kind of defeats the purpose of WebAssembly, but I had to put it up here just so people would say I didn't you know, forget it. Um, and then lastly, and this is perhaps where I'm gonna focus on, is um, system call sandboxing. So you can put it in a sandbox which limits what operations the program can ask the kernel uh, to perform on its behalf. So this is like the next layer underneath the, the WebAssembly runtime. Um, so the way this works is there's the subsystem called seccomp. You can ask the kernel, hey, only allow me to perform syscalls with these patterns, uh, and the kernel will validate every call you make. Um, so this style of sandboxing is tricky to get right. It's really cumbersome. You have to know all the syscalls your program does um, before you, you know, like ask the kernel to limit. And if you miss any, you, you know, that's kind of troublesome. The kernel will, will reject you um, and your program will crash. So that's, that's a problem when you have multi-tenancy. That's a problem in general. Um, but WebAssembly runtimes, as complex as they are, they have a relatively fixed set of behaviors, really. They load and JIT compile the, the WebAssembly guest programs. They instantiate instances of those programs, including some linear memories, um, and then they execute uh, those programs. So those programs will do a bunch of stuff with their memory, and then eventually they'll do a host call. So once you figure out what the runtime does um, and what limited sets of behavior in the, the host calls you have, um, you can set up a syscall profile. Um, Chrome does this 
for render processes in an attempt to mitigate unknown bugs in V8 and the DOM and WebAssembly and just all the things that go into the magic of rendering a web page. Um, it does take a ton of effort to build precise syscall profiles. Um, even when you control all the software, like everything uses libraries um, and it's, it's really hard to, to kind of like know what everything under the stack of your software is doing. Uh, but we can write software to generate and apply the profiles instead uh, using a branch of computing science known as program analysis. So um, with program analysis, you could yield precise sandbox profiles uh, that tightly limit what your WebAssembly runtime can perform. And I built software to do exactly this. Um, it's not specific to WebAssembly. Um, it's called Colander. Um, but I'm going to take it here and apply it to a WebAssembly runtime. So it does static analysis on the scale of whole programs, libraries, complex control flow, loop-de-loops, switch statements, everything. Um, it generates and applies a seccomp profile that applies to the program. Um, and you do it by prefixing your program with colander like you might do with strace. So um, I've applied it to wasm time, so it's like colander dash wasm time, right? Uh, to add this extra layer of isolation. Um, so it generates precisely scoped profiles without manual effort. Um, and it does this um, in a really sort of precise way by knowing exactly what operations and syscalls the, the program performs. Um, so this means we can actually sandbox just like entire WebAssembly runtimes um, without actually doing all that hard work to investigate all the minutia of the operations they perform. And so it models the imagined possible states of the program it's sandboxing, in this case, WASM time, and as it goes, so it doesn't have to, you know, engineers don't have to do that hard work. And it does all this to get a complete picture of what system calls are possible, even in those obscure error paths that, you know, happen in, in seldomly. Uh, it's important to note that Colander can be more precise than just the system call numbers. It knows what range of values are possible for each argument, and this is much more detailed than a human could be expected to write. And it, you'll see in a moment why I wanted to apply it to WebAssembly runtimes. And that's because many security system, uh, sensitive system calls, like those that can add new executable code, um, kind of only happen like at startup and program initialization, um, and when WebAssembly modules are loaded. And then once the program gets going, it should like never do that again. And that is something that attackers generally do during their, their attack. So um, Colander applies the program when you ask it to, and so it can do it just after the program finishes starting, and it can block any syscalls that are only used to initialize. So here is WASM times, and the text is tiny, so I apologize for that. Um, these are WASM times memory mapping syscalls that it, it figured out. And you'll notice only one of them is prod exec. So prod exec is asking for an executable memory mapping. Um, so it doesn't make memory mappings after it's finished uh, compiling WebAssembly code. So colanders can just wait until all that startup compilation finishes and then tell the kernel, like, allow it to continue to mmap and, and protect, but never with the prod exec option. And that means we can block shell code just entirely, like no shell code. Um, attacker can compromise the guest, and as soon as they try, they will get blocked. Uh, so Colin doesn't really have any specific knowledge of WASM time. Um, I only had to tell it, like, here's the point at which the program undergoes a phase change. Um, and it should apply equally well in future versions and to other WebAssembly runtimes. Um, it is available on GitHub, and it runs on most x86 Linux distributions. Um, I'm, I'm looking at other architectures, but right now it is architecture specific. Um, and so with this, um, I hope all of you learned a little bit about sort of like WebAssembly's isolation. I'm a huge fan of, of just sort of like where it's going, especially the component model stuff with nested runtimes and being able to interrupt between languages freely is just fascinating and really exciting. Um, and I want to get more people into it. Um, I'm excited to get the like isolation properties just as bulletproof as possible. And I think it's going to be magical when we can just like have fine grain isolation like between the different parts of our software uh, without having to do microservices or anything like that. 
Um, so I'm actually really eager to see what additional steps the community is taking to secure their WebAssembly runtimes and software, especially if you run like a multi-tenant platform. That absolutely fascinates me. Um, so thanks for your time and attention. Um, I'm Ryan Petrich, basically at our Petrich everywhere. And uh, if you like weird hackery things, give me a shout. Incredible talk. Um, any questions for Ryan? Over here. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. <clears throat> I checked the uh, GitHub repo of Calendar, uh, but I couldn't uh, find the source code and the license. Uh, so could you uh, tell me uh, where I can find the source code and what's the license of this software? I am trying to figure out the licensing right now. I'm committed to making it open source, but uh, that'll be wrapped up pretty pretty soon. Uh, so, so it's not open source at, at this moment? Right now, I only have the, the binary available, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but I think uh, this conference is uh, mostly uh, committed to uh, open source software, so it should be nice uh, if, uh, we could, if uh, you could uh, open source software uh, before the uh, conference next time. Yeah, I'm, 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 the plan is to have it be GPL v3. I just ran out of time for yeah. the, the purposes of this conference. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you.